Welcome back again, everybody, to our podcasts from the 2017 Goodwood Revival. As you can probably see, it's tea time at the Revival cricket match. But we're not going to let tea come between us. And uh, with me now is, uh, as you can see, Stuart Graham. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's, it's always a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm not going to, yeah. I'll only keep you from your cake for about yeah. 15 minutes. <laughs> Because I know that you've been running a lot in the cricket match, haven't you? You've been running up and down the pitch. Well, maybe a little bit, but not as much as I should have done, of course. But, you know, us skinny people need plenty of sort of fuel every now and again. I never know whether to start with bikes or cars with you. Or actually, John, John Surtees always, always hated it when I said bikes, motorcycles or cars. But um, it all began, didn't it? The Stuart Graham career began on two wheels. Well, it did, actually. And as John once described it when referring to the bike scene, and he referred to it as a previous life. And sometimes I tend to use the same terminology because it almost feels like it sometimes. And whenever I go back, in fact, I've recently been to the Isle of Man for the classic thing. I was invited over there for a, a something. And yeah, it's a bit like stepping back in time, but it's great fun and it does bring back an awful lot of very happy memories, I have to say, you know. I bet it does, absolutely. <laughs> so tell me, how did it all begin? I mean, what, why did, what was it about racing that, that, that got in your blood? Well, I, I'm afraid it was probably bred into me. I blame my parents, as we all do, but my dear late father, Les Graham, was uh, a world champion in the 49. And so we grew up with it, my younger brother and myself, and so um, it's always been there. And although we sadly lost my father in the TT in 1953, um, it still didn't deter me from, uh, much to my mother's disappointment, I'm sure, getting involved with motorcycles and starting racing and, you know, who, and suddenly I'd got a career. People like me who've always loved car racing talk about motorcycle racing as being horribly dangerous. and. We just don't really understand. D does that, did that element of it, does it ever occur to guys like you? I mean, or is it just something you live with? I think it's something that you live with and it's amazing what one can blank out when, yeah. when necessary. And yes, I think motorcycle racing is dangerous. And of course, when I was doing it, um, all the Grand Prix were on what the termed road circuits. I mean, the Isle of Man was just one of many and uh, safety hadn't been invented as it were so if you didn't hit a tree or a building you were pretty lucky but that's how it was it was the same on four wheels so i suppose we grew up with that sort of weird system but you survived if you could and that's the deal i mean nobody makes you do it of course you make your own choices so but i was very fortunate i didn't seriously hurt myself which is pretty unusual and so I was pretty lucky and very happy to survive that uh, 1960s period of serious stuff. And of course the machines we were racing in the way of the Hondas and the Suzukis were pretty exotic and slightly strange machines. But it was a pretty uh, amazing era, I have to say. Tony Brooks always says that he never allowed himself to drive beyond what he knew were his own limits. Is that something that y you would have thought to yourself as well? Uh, I think possibly so. I mean, Tony is a very intelligent guy and sometimes maybe some of us should have maybe thought a bit more about it. But I do have this rather strange saying these days in, in, in hindsight that motorcycle racing is something you do until the rest of your brain fully develops. Well, yours, yours clearly did fully develop, but we'll get on to that in a minute. Um, now, you're one of the few men who conquered the Isle of Man, and that's that's something to be extremely proud of. Um, can you explain to us wh what is it about the place that's given it this mythological status? Well, I think the mythology is actually part of it. I mean, it is a very strange place to race around, and in fact, we were only talking about it last weekend. If you came up with this wonderful idea, let's close most of the main roads around the Isle of Man and let's race motorbikes right round it, flat out, people would say, what? You must be mad, but it, that's the way it is. And it is a strange place. It's so long, the lap, 37 and three quarter miles, and it is obviously unique nearly now. Um, but it's a sort of place because of the history and because of all the various stories and the things that have happened over the years, it's taken on this sort of amazing status, which does make it unique. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very frightening place. 
and I always reckon that every rider is always highly relieved to leave the Isle of Man unassisted at the end of the fortnight's TT we have the time. So, um, yeah, it's a very strange place, but it's a wonderful place to still have, and we're lucky that it still carries on. We can we can joke about it, of course, and and all, all you guys will will joke about it because that you're that's the sort of people you are. But bef before a race like that, did you ever sort of you know did you have nerves thinking, I'm going to go up into that mountain? It could be misty, it could be cloudy. I'm going to do him way over a hundred miles. And I mean, this is this is one hell of a challenge. It, it is really, and of course it, it's, it's ridiculous. And you know, in hindsight, you tend to look at it more and analyse it more than maybe you did at the time. But I always knew that the Isle of Man was the ultimate challenge, and. I, if I'm honest, I never in fully enjoyed it, and with the history of my father being killed there, it was obviously there was always something slightly in the back of your mind that sort of made you be slightly careful. But you had to switch off and get on with it, and especially when you're a factory rider and Mr. Honda and Mr. Suzuki are expecting you, then you just get on with it, and so that's what you had to do. And um, yeah, I, I was uh, I was lucky. Things went well for me there, and um, you know I had a pretty good record, and I didn't manage to hurt myself, so I was very fortunate. But it's just that sort of race that um, you're always glad when it's over. You say you were lucky, but I, I mean clearly you had the most amazing, close relationship with a motorcycle, which is very necessary if you're going to be a regular winner, isn't it? I mean, you you and the bike have got to be just about one, haven't you? Well, yes, and as dear John Surtis used to recall, that you know, trying to make yourself and the machine as one is the ultimate trick. Um, the machines that we were riding in period, um, the early Japanese machines were amazing, but most of the effort was in the engine, so the handling was never what you might call wonderful. So it was always a bit of a battle of who was in charge, especially around the island. So you had to treat both machine and circuit with the greatest of respect. But I think it's like all these things, it's, it was the job at the time and you just got on with it. Um, the fact that you probably let the emotions arrive afterwards thinking, yeah. well, you know. But I know most of us took the view that as you finished the island and had done, you think, well, OK, we've got away with it for another year. But, um, yeah, it's like all these mental adjustments that one makes when necessary, I think. Tell me, did, did some of the other big races that, that you won and, and the other big races that, that, that in which you competed, did they seem a little bit tame after something like that? Well, not always, actually, because some of the other circuits, as we mentioned earlier, were all mainly road circuits, the old Spa, the old Saxon Ring, yeah. Imatra in Finland, which was completely tree-lined. Um, you know, you could go on, the old Nürburgring, as we know, but... Um, and we did street races along the Italian Adriatic coast. And I mean, it was frankly ridiculous when you look at it when, with a modern look at things. But that's what went on at the time, and that's what we did. And it's like everything else, as um, uh, one says, many racers will come up with the old Frank Gardner saying, greed overcomes fear. <laughs> and so therefore, if the starting money or the prize money is good enough, you get on with it. So this is ridiculous, really. But uh, we, do miss Frank. we do miss Frank. We do miss Frank. I know, a wonderful character. Anyway, um, it's interesting to me that motorcycle racing today is still incredibly exciting. It, it's seriously thrilling stuff. Whereas Formula One, I, th it, I think, has got less thrilling as the years have gone by. And that's partly, is it, because there's actually less you can do to a bike, isn't there, if you see what I mean? Yes, I think that even though the modern bikes have got quite a bit of technology, there's still the same battle between staying upright and not. And ultimately, a motorbike's a fairly simple device in comparison to a modern Formula One car, which is an extremely complex device. So therefore, the spectacle, you're quite right. I mean, you know, we watch the thing, and I have to say the current riders, especially young Mar Marquez, is just amazing and uh, you watch and you think there's just no way that thing's going to go around the corner but it somehow it does and he defies gravity and everything else but that's what makes the spectacle and that keeps you on the edge of your seat and whilst our formula one drivers are also hugely brilliant and talented we can't see what's happening in the cockpit and therefore we can't somehow connect with the the effort required Talking about being in the cockpit, you made the decision t 
to switch to cars, just as John Surtees did, actually. Um, he, and he always said that to begin with, it was pr quite difficult, actually, quite challenging, because it, I it is a completely different um, s set of skills in many ways. Well, yes, it is a different discipline. Um, the circuits are slightly different with four wheels than two. Uh, there isn't as much room for a start. But um, I, I think, yes, uh, fortunately, I seem to be able to adapt quite easily. And uh, things went well for me, uh, certainly in the touring cars. But, I mean, I didn't set out to have another career. It was very much something I thought, well, I fancy trying that. It sounds like a bit of fun and da -da -da. it's better than gardening at the weekends, you know. So, and of course, the, the difficulty is when you start to do something and it turns out you're reasonably good at it, well then of course it opens up a whole new thing. And so, yeah, I loved the cars. I've always followed cars very closely, even when I was involved with motorcycles. I equally followed the car scene and um, it was a natural progression from my point of view. And my motorcycle career had been probably curtailed a little earlier than... Uh, because the factories all pulled out of the World Championships in 1968 or something. So it meant that, you know, I didn't really carry it on with it as long as I might have done. So then it opened up other opportunities and I, I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed the car scene and to me it's in my natural territory these days and has been for an awful long time. And you had a roof over your head, of course, which was another new thing with you. I think probably yes, and I started with that. There was then a plan at one stage for me to try Formula 5000 yeah. at the time, but I took a very careful view of that and I uh, thought about it a bit. And I then thought, do I really want to start to learn something different? Mm. Because obviously with the single seaters, the setup of the yeah. car was more technical, and yeah. you know, the, and also there was obviously an added danger element. Yeah. And I thought, in fairness to my dear wife and family and to myself, having survived motorcycle racing, I thought, do I really want to go and stick my neck just that little bit further out? So I felt that I could win and do what I wanted to do in touring cars and all the rest of it, it was coming. So I thought, no, I'll stick with that, which I think was probably a reasonably sensible decision. Winning, of course, is what it's all about. All, all you guys, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're on one wheel, two wheels, three wheels or four, winning's what it's about. And you... You just kept on winning, you know, bikes and cars, and even now, I mean, this is ridiculous. Have you, are you an incredibly competitive person anyway? I don't see myself as incredibly competitive. Um, I probably take the lazy route. If it comes naturally, then I'll get on with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's just a natural thing. I enjoy doing it, and... Um, it turns out that I seem to be reasonably okay at it. I mean, I'm sure I could be better if I maybe put more effort in in certain areas, but I just get in and do it, and I just enjoy it. Um, and so, to me, it's been absolutely great fun, and it's nice. I mean, obviously, we all say the same thing, especially here at Goodwood. You know, oh, this is just a bit of fun. We yeah. just enjoy it. But we're all the same. When the flag drops, suddenly yeah. all those competitive urges kick in, and off we go. It's ridiculous. It's a bit pathetic, really, isn't it? I don't know, it's very entertaining. <laughs> Finally, Stuart, can I ask you to pick one, one triumph from your motorcycling days and one from your car racing days that when you sit back, you know, if, if and when you eventually stop racing, that, that you'll remember with, with the most um, pride and happiness? Well, I think, like every racer, there are lots and lots of different races where you've enjoyed it, you've had great satisfaction. But I think picking individual ones is difficult yeah. um, because in each case, whenever you've won, it's been good. But I suppose one's got to look back at my age and stage now and look at think what are the career-defining moments yeah. of the yeah. wins. And so, obviously, the motorcycle TTs yeah. And, of course, the car TTs look good on your CV. And at the time, they were hugely rewarding, especially the car TT and the Camaro when people didn't think a Camaro would last the distance and all that sort of thing. And normally you had two drivers and all these. So everything came together. And I think that was very satisfying. And so there have been lots of races which I've been hugely satisfied with, but I suppose having to pick them out, it sounds a bit corny, I know, but probably the bike TT and the car TT... It probably defined my career quite nicely. I should know the answer to this, but I don't. <laughs> are, are you the only man to have won? No, you're not. 
TTs on two wheels and four? Uh, no, no because Freddie because Dixon did it before the war. And did John Surtees win a c car TT? No. no, he didn't. No, no. He, he, yeah. he nearly won one at Goodwood. Yes. It, yeah. Yes. Yes, I mean, I occasionally we used to wind John up, you know, with things like that, as one does in a jocular mood. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a nice little unique record, yeah. which has obviously not done me any harm. And, um, you know, yeah. I can't say I've ever made a huge fuss over it, but the older I get, yeah, we the more now, we talk. We uh, yes, it, it gets talked about more now than it ever used to do, if you know what I mean, and I'm not complaining. <laughs> Apparently you guys get faster and faster the older you get, is that always, right? Always, always. All racers do. You know, it's been well established. <laughs> you need to have your tea, and thank you very much for it's joining been a us. Pleasure, thank you. Stuart Graham, everybody. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, we'll be back again uh, with another of our podcasts from the 2017 Goodwood Revival, but it's bye-bye for now.